Modesty is not one of Mr. Lewis's virtues. His fans think he's adorable, and Mr. Lewis admires their taste. I'm being honest, I'm not bragging. Uh, as far as money goes, I'll just, it, it don't mean that much to me. I'm just talking about a God-given talent, a stylist. Jerry Lee Lewis is back all right. He's been wrecking pianos for 15 years, and he's more popular now than ever. He's lost the pink complexion which fans thought so dishy in the 50s, the wavy locks have thinned, and he's grown a beard for the title role in a play about Christ. But the scandals of the past are forgiven. The wiggle of his 36-year-old hips is enough to send the audience wild. Such hysteria has recently been reserved for beat groups, but even the Beatles are fans of Mr. Lewis, and many believe he's the greatest rock and roller alive. Mr. Lewis arrives in Glasgow accompanied by his personal television producer. He also has a five-man band of rockers, and in the States, he employs two pilots to fly a couple of private planes he bought to carry him around to concerts. The secret of Mr. Lewis's success is that he's got staying power for a rocker. The other rock and rollers of the 50s either faded away, or like Mr. Elvis Presley, they simply got tired of rocking. Mr. Lewis performs now, just like he did in the 50s. Mr. Lewis is particularly remembered for his great balls of fire. This melody and his rendering of whole lot of shaking going on sold more than 20 million records throughout the world. His private life was the problem. He had two wives before he was 22. Wife number three caused the scandal in Britain. 
Miss Myra Brown was his cousin and a child of 13. When the fans booed him off stage and accused him of baby snatching, Mr Lewis packed it in and said his career in Britain was finished. Yet Mr Lewis kept on singing and in the States when rock and roll fell from favour, he became one of the highest paid country and western singers. Today he's got all the trappings of wealth. Flashy diamond rings, two luxury homes, a fleet of expensive cars and also wife number four. On tour, Mr. Lewis leads a somewhat confined life. Until he goes to the theater, he refuses to leave his hotel. It's reputed that you're a very rich man. Um, if that's true, uh, and you are a very rich man, um, wh why do you keep on working? Well, I'll tell you, my boy, <laughs> no, I've, I've made a lot of money. And uh, I guess you could say that I'm the only man in the world who's made $14 million and spent 16. Have you made $14 million? Oh, I made a lot more than that. Really? Why do you keep on working? Because I love to play the piano. I love to sing. And I will do it until the good Lord calls me home. Today, 15 years after he earned his first scream from a teenage bopper, Mr. Lewis still needs Big Dick, his bodyguard, to protect him from over-enthusiastic fans. Big Dick normally carries a gun, but he couldn't bring it to Britain. Tonight, Mr. Lewis will give two concerts, and few rockers of his age could still fill a hole like this. the females. He excites the males. For these fans, this moment ends 16 years of longing. They're meeting the man they first rocked to in their teens. Mr. Lewis is more popular than ever today because he helps these fans remember the good old 1950s when they were rockers too. How long have you been a fan? 16 years. Fan of Jerry Lewis. I was at the airport this morning at 1 o'clock. I come off night shift this morning and rushed to the airport to see if I could get a glimpse of him. Unfortunately, I couldn't. But my night's been made tonight. Yeah. I've been trying to see him for 15 years and failed until tonight. He's been in Glasgow twice before and I was unlucky. And I don't really think I'm taking a sentimental journey. I think my talent is proving out to be what it is the greatest talent in the field of music that I'm in yet. Now, I don't compare myself with uh, other talents like uh, Beethoven or this or that. Uh, you know, these are stylists before my time or Hank Williams' time or Al Jolson or Jimmy Rogers. This is goes way back. But, uh, I'm talking about what's happening now. No, I'm not taking a sentimental journey, sir. I've been journeying ever since I was born. I was born feet first. My daddy and a doctor delivered me 
And I come out jumping, and I've been jumping ever since. Mr. Lewis may be a symbol of a growing nostalgia for the 50s, when his style of country and western rock revolutionized popular music. And perhaps the kids of today might find his style to be somewhat dated. present-day kings of beat they worship are in a way carbon copies of rockers like him. Men who started it all and can't quite bear to give it up or abandon the gimmicks which made them famous.
Did, did, did the launch chair go off? Yeah, yeah. You could see that. You could see it. I, I had the sky when it disconnected up there. Gigi never saw the explosion. I didn't no, know I it. Didn't. I had launch because it just launched right over here. <laughs> I had launch. I, 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 I was buried in a beaver. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> how was your launch? <laughs> <laughs> a story I have to tell to the world that's never been told before. Elvis, one rainy, hot summer night here in Nashville about seven or eight years ago, what you did for me will always be a part of my life forever, as you will be for millions. You see, I was sitting on the back steps of RCA's Studio B that hot summer night. I guess trying to get out of the rain. Not knowing it was you inside the studio recording. When some man opened the door and I stood up and he asked me if I would go after some candy bars. I guess maybe he thought 
I worked there as a cleanup boy or something, but I really didn't. When I got back to the studio door, the candy bars and the paper bag was wet, and so was I. You see, I hadn't had a car for about six years. I knocked on the door, and the same man let me in. Then I heard a voice ask that I bring the candy bars into the studio. When I saw it was you that I got the candy bars for, I became very weak all over. I guess it was too much for a poor boy and a nobody like me to be bringing candy bars to a king like you. I remember you asked me my name and shook my hand and thanked me. And then you reached in your pocket and gave me a $20 bill and said, here, I want you to have this. You never did know it else, but that $20 bill I guess, in a big way, saved my life. You see, I'd been sleeping in the back of an old wrecked station wagon, just up from the studio, for about 11 days, with only change in my pocket. And to be honest, I really hadn't eaten for almost two days. I never did see you again after that, but I want the whole world to know, if they don't already, the many little and big things you did for many people, such as myself. Elvis, I only wish I could have the chance again today to run to that same little store in the rain get you some more candy bars. I was barely six years old when I first heard him sing. And somehow I knew from that moment on that it would be a lifetime thing. And I'd stand in front of a mirror day and night and I'd listen to every one of his records and, and I'd repeat every word and every note until I finally got it right. And I was determined that I'd wait for the day that I could stand and sing in front of an audience and maybe someone would come up to me and say, you know, you sound just like Elvis. There was a man who gave the world his song and the world stood still to hear him sing. A simple man Took his faith alone While all the world Proclaimed him king Now the king is gone And oh what a rain And the crown on his head Will remain From a working man To royalty To everlasting fame King is gone, yeah, the king is gone, but long live his name. There was a man who tasted sweet success, but still gave his hand to help a friend. 
A loving man who shed his happiness Now the king is gone But there was a man Now the king is gone And oh, what a rain And the crown on his head All will remain From a working man to royalty To everlasting fame The king is gone Yeah, the king is gone Long with his name Here the king is gone Oh, the king is gone Long live his name Goodbye, Elvis We'll miss you tamer than you were, I think. Uh, you had a w more wild image. Am I correct in thinking that? Well, I think Elvis uh, was uh, a little bit more conservative yeah. <laughs> than I was. Uh, he hid himself more, I would say, from the public mm. than I did. I, I was more uh, wide open than Elvis. I never hid anything. Mm. Whatever I did, I, I never tried to hold it a secret. There's one story that, that is, I, I read constantly about you, that you went to Graceland, you had a gun, the sheriff comes, takes you away. What is the, the truth behind that story, if there is any? But, but what happened? Uh, Elvis, in the last days there, he was, well, about 15 times he called me on the phone, you know, and he 
said, Jerry, I got to see you. It's very important. I'm very depressed, and I want to talk to you. You know, I need to talk to you bad. And I just couldn't visualize Elvis Presley being down and out, depressed about anything. And I, I shunned him off, and I didn't go. You know, and one night he caught me down at the Vapors Club there in Memphis, about a mile or so from his home. And it was about two o'clock in the morning, and I and to admit the truth about it, I was. I was drinking a lot of champagne at night. I don't like champagne. Mm -hmm. It made me a little wild, you know. Mm -hmm. A little bit. <laughs> and so, yeah, really. Yeah. And so, to say the least. So <laughs> I went out and got my Lincoln car, you know. I said, well, I'm going to come down and see you, so I'll be there in a minute, you know. <laughs> so I walked outside, and Mr. Ford, Charlie Ford, on the vapors. He said, Jerry, just a minute, I have a present for you. And he gave me this 38 Dillinger pistol. It was brand new. I've never been fired. I still have it. Never have been fired. And I, I said, oh, thank you, Mr. Fool. And I went to put it in my glove compartment. He said, no, put this on the dashboard. If you can seal it in your glove compartment, it's against the law, run you down, it's against the law. But if you put it on your dashboard, you're not going it. It's not against the law. Mm -hmm. Take it home. I said, okay, well, I forgot I was going by Elvis's house. <laughs> so you drove by with the gun. So I drove by, and the gun was there on the dashboard. Mm -hmm. And I, when I turned into Elvis's house, it was front end of that Lincoln. It looked like it was a mile long to me. And I misjudged it, and I ran into his gate. <laughs> And he had hired a new guard. Travis wasn't on the gate. His uncle. Hmm. He had a new guard on the gate. So he came running out there, and I, I hit the gate, and it was shaking all over like he was doing a show on there. You know? <laughs> and it was kind of funny to me. I don't know. And uh, he said, well, what do you want? I said, well, the others called me and want to see me. He said, yeah, who are you? I said, well, I just tell him Jerry Lee's here. You know? And he saw that gun on the <laughs> <laughs> car. And he ran back and he called the law. And so I'm sitting there, you know, and a minute later, the law, about five or six squad cars surrounded my car, you know. And I'm sitting there looking at it, and I was really loaded. <laughs> and I went to put the seat back on the car, and instead of putting the seat back, I was putting the window down. <laughs> and I didn't know it, I threw this champagne bottle out the window, and I thought it was down, and knocked the whole window clean out. So they knew I was loaded. Uh, and it was embarrassing. <laughs> I said, what are you going to do with that gun? You going to shoot it up as president? I said, well, if you're silly enough to think that, I said, probably so. And that's where it came. And he said, get out of that car, the old kid. Uh, that, that was the deal on that. And it was waiting, waiting, waiting on me. You know? Was there ever any competition between the two of you? Did you ever feel that? that I mean, you're both, no. you know, the, the leaders of, of, of a movement, almost a revolution. We, we considered ourselves both Kings of rock and roll, so to speak, coming in our own way. He, he considered himself the number one artist. I did too. And the uh, only thing I'd done what I wanted to do, Elvis, he wanted to do the things I did, but he was scared too. And he tried to do it and, and hide it. And, and so I said, Elvis, you know, you ought to be your own man, do what you want to do. Don't let these people tell you what to do. Well, Elvis Presley was a fine person. And I, and I miss him very much. And he was one of my dear friends. Somebody I could depend on, yeah. When when you talk about uh, as you saw yourself as you both saw yourself as kings, a, a question I was wanting to ask you is, um, when when the history of rock and roll is written, where will your place be? Well, I, I was the first artist inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 